Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. I'm James Oldfield here with you, and we're glad that you are continuing to study the Bible with us tonight. I want to put our contact information up here for you. A Word from the Lord at gmail.com if you want to email me, or 276-340-2653 is how you can reach me by phone. We want to invite you out to our assemblies on Sundays at 9 and 10, Thursdays at 7 p.m. Study God's Word with us. We hope that you will take advantage of that. I know sometimes... People don't like to get out because it's getting darker earlier, but nonetheless, I know it'd be profitable to you and it'll be encouraging to us. We'll be glad to see you if you want to come out and study God's Word with us tonight. I know many people are getting ready for a particular day that's coming up, so with that in mind, I wanted to ask you about specific dates and see if you know the significance of them. What do these dates mean to you? If I said Friday, November the 22nd, 1963, would that jog anyone's memory? Some of you may have not even been born yet. I wasn't even born yet. Sunday, December 7th, 1941. It's a pretty much infamous day, I might, you might, might say. Tuesday, September the 11th, 2001. Some of those dates probably stick out in your mind. Some of them may not. But all of these dates have something in common. The thing that happened was events changed the world on those days. On November the uh, 22nd, the 1963, is when John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. And uh, December the 7th, 1941, it was the bombing of Pearl Harbor, a day that will live in infamy, as Roosevelt said. And, of course, uh, September the 11th, 2001, was when the World Trade Centers were uh, destroyed. Planes flew into them and destroyed them. And most people remember where they were on that day. But the reason why this is so significant is because they changed our lives. They changed our world. They, they're marked in history. They're marked in our lives, if you will. And so that is why they're so powerful. It's because events took place that everybody remembers. Everybody knows what happened and how it affected the world around about them. But there are some dates that may not be so familiar. But the ones that change our lives are the ones that we hold to. And we even uh, commemorate them even. For example, when Israel left Egyptian bondage. Now, Michael was talking about this some, and I thought, well, have we been uh, on the same wavelength? But notice this. When Israel left Egyptian bondage in Exodus 12, I want you to notice something. It changed the world. It didn't just change the world. It changed the calendar. For notice what the Bible says. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, or God said to Israel, the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So for the children of Israel, leaving the land of Egypt, leaving uh, the Egyptian bondage, it changed their calendar. They, they have a whole new calendar, and even today, people still follow that calendar. How do you know that? Because the Passover is still observed by, by some individuals. It's still on the calendar. Everybody knows what it is. Why? Because it's the same time. It's the same, it's the same time after the, what is the first full moon after the vernal equinox of the, I don't know, third Tuesday that ends in Y, I guess. I don't know. But people still keep it. Why? Because it was a great event. It changed the world. That's my whole point. So when God tells them that you're going to be leaving Egypt and this is going to be a new beginning to you, then it, it marks the world. And notice this. When they left Egypt, everybody knows the story, the parting of the Red Seas. God led them through the wilderness. God led them through the wilderness by a, a, a cloud and day and a pillar of fire by night. The Red Sea parted. And it was on this occasion that everybody still remembers the children of Israel marched through on dry land. They marched through on dry land and then the Egyptians followed them and of course the waters returned and destroyed all the Egyptian army. How was that significant? Why, what happened on this day? Well, listen to how people talked about it. The whole world, the modern day world then, was talking about what God did for the children of Israel and what he did to the Egyptians. In Exodus chapter 18, Exodus chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, when Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, 
heard of all that God had done for Moses and for the Israel and his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt, then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, and uh, they had two sons. All right, skip on down, let's skip on down to verse 9. Notice what he says to Moses. Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh, the Egyptians, for Israel's sake, and all the travail that had come upon them by the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who hath delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of Pharaoh, who hath delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods, for in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices. Uh, for the uh, for God and for Aaron and all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. So they they remembered what was happening, and everybody was talking about it. Even Jethro, uh, Moses' father-in-law, was talking about. It. I know that God is greater than all the other gods. All down through history, when you're reading of the Israel's going through the wilderness, they're always being reminded of what God did. Notice, for example, another example. Forty years later, forty years later after this event, in Joshua chapter two and verse nine. Joshua two and verse nine. This is what Rahab says to the spies. The spies come in to spy out the land of Jericho or the city of Jericho. And uh, she hides them. Rahab hides them. Before they were laid down, she came, up to them, uh, she came up unto them on the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord uh, hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all that happens to the land faint because of you. For we have heard how, God, how, the Lord, how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what he did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sahan and Og, uh, who ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heaven above and in the earth beneath. And notice, and now therefore I pray you swear unto me by the Lord since you have showed you, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token. So what was happening? Forty years after they crossed the Red Sea, forty years after God had destroyed Egypt, uh, the Egyptian army, forty years after they passed on dry land, forty years after they had wandered in the wilderness eating manna and their shoes never worn out, all of these things continued to be in the minds of the Canaanites, and Rahab says. We heard these things and our heart didn't melt because we knew what God had done for you. And so it was an event that, that changed the world. The, the, the coming up out of Egypt, the Passover, where all the firstborn in Egypt were destroyed in, in the houses that didn't have the blood upon the poles. All of these individuals were destroyed. That resonated with people. You know, a, a, a great destruction like that, a great battle like that was going to be remembered. It was going to be written down. It's going to be talked about. And thus, when they crossed the Red Sea, another great event in history that all the inhabitants of the land were talking about. Why? Because something great had happened on that day. It was a, a great day in history. So that 40 years later, the inhabitants of the land are still talking about it. But it's not just that. It's not just that, friends. Notice this. Not only did the inhabitants of the land talk about it, <clears throat> but it was still commemorated. It was songs were written about it. You know, I don't know about you, but one of my, some of my favorite songs are songs that tell stories about events, true events, or, or individuals that, that uh, had a place in history. Uh, when I grew up, I was listening to Johnny Horton. You know, and he sank the Bismarck, and they marched down to New Orleans, and and those are songs that that tell about history. Now, I don't know how uh, factual correct, factually correct they are, 
But nonetheless, those are events that are commemorated in song. And why? Because they were earth-changing or life-changing, history-changing. They were great days in history. And so it is the case that the psalmist wrote about coming up out of Egypt and coming out of, out of uh, all the Passover and uh, being delivered by, by God's hand. In Psalm 106, Psalm 106, verse 9, He rebuked the Red Sea also. It was dried up. So he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. They believed his words and they sang his praise. Songs were written about these events. If you go back and look in Exodus chapter 15, uh, you have, you have songs being sung right then about the deliverance that was being given. Why? Because it was a great day in history. Things were, it was things that, that people were going to talk about. And just to show you how they were still talking about it, consider this. In uh, Psalm 36, I'm sorry, getting a little ahead of myself. Psalm, Psalm 136 and verse 13. To him which divided the Red Sea into parts, and his mercy endureth for, for his mercy endureth forever, and made Israel to pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endureth forever. Uh, and over, but overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which smote great kings, for his mercy endureth forever. And slew famous kings, for his mercy endureth forever. Sahan, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever. And Og, the king of Bashan, for his mercy endureth forever. And gave them their land for an heritage, for his mercy endureth forever. Even an heritage unto the Israel, his servant, for his mercy endureth forever. These are things that commemorate great things that God did. And they're remembered in Psalms. Why? Because they're talking about great days in history. Nehemiah, a thousand years later, almost a thousand years later, is still talking about the deliverance from Egypt. You know that? Think about this in Nehemiah, Nehemiah 9 and verse 9. Now, why is this, why is this important? Why is this significant? Well, it's significant because when you think about how long time goes on, and people are still remembering it. Friends, do we celebrate things that happened a thousand years ago? You think about that. Do we celebrate things that happened a thousand years ago? I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head. Do we celebrate something that happened a thousand years ago? Well, Nehemiah's writing about it. Notice this in Nehemiah 9 9. And did see the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard us their cry by the Red Sea and showed us signs. And wanders upon Pharaoh and upon all his servants and on all the people of the lands for thou knewest that they dwelt proudly against them so didst thou get thee a name as it is this day. And thou didst divide the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land and their persecutors thou threwest into the deeps as they stone into the mighty waters. What is he talking about? He's talking about parting the Red Sea, more would thou let us them in the day by a cloudy pillar and a night by a pillar of fire to give them light in the way wherein they should go. Now, these are things that happen, great days in history. They're remembering them. They're remembering them. And so my point is, friends, when you think about what God did that marked history to the point that calendars changed and people... Uh, celebrated a feast and they keep commemorating that feast over and over, year after year after year. Why? It's because it was a great event in history. It was a great day that, that they need to remember. Now, God's power in the Exodus it left a mark on the world. We've already said we're pointing this out. It, it still can be seen today. I mean the Passover 
was that mark of when God delivered them from Egyptian bondage. And uh, it was kept as an observance of, of those events that had taken place. And so what a, what a great day it must have been. You know, I, I just, I'm trying to think about what it would have been like on that first Passover. It, I imagine it would have been somewhat uh, terrifying. You had to have your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, you're eating this roasted uh, lamb with unleavened bread, and you're you're ready to go on a moment's notice. When God says go, you're supposed to get up and let go. And uh, you can probably hear cries of, of people dying or crying over people who have died because they lost their firstborn. And all that was protecting you was that blood upon the door. And so, no doubt about it, it was a great, great occasion to the point that people still remembered the Passover and carried it out. Even when Jesus was, was young, in Luke uh, 2, verse 41, for example, you find Jesus going with his parents to the temple, and, and Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, under Judea, <clears throat> under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of uh, because he was the lineage of David, I'm sorry. Verse 41, that's four. That didn't make sense. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. Think about that. They went every year. You know, I see people, I don't see the same ones, but I see a lot of uh, RVs and stuff that come down and they'll go to Martinsville every year. There's people I'm sure that make the trip every year to Martinsville for the race. They may make it twice a year. I don't know. What are they doing? Well, they're, they're, they're celebrating. They're commemorating. They're keeping a date or something. There they're saying, hey, this is something we're looking forward to. We're going to go to this place. We're going to do this thing. We're going to uh, participate in this event. Why? Special occasion. Special occasion. But Israel has been doing this for thousands of years. They've been keeping this Passover. They've been keeping this Passover. In John chapter 2 and verse 13, the Jews' Passover was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. That's the Passover. Jesus went up. He kept the Passover. He kept the Passover. As a matter of fact, Matthew 26, Matthew 26 and verse 19, the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them and they made ready the Passover. Jesus told them, hey, Go and make ready. You go find, go to the city, find such a man, say to him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover of thy house with thy disciples. And they did it. Now why would they do this? They're commemorating a great event. They're, they're remembering a great day. A great day in history. A, a day that, that changed the world, you might say. And so, these are simply this a way of demonstrating God's power that he had to change the world so that everybody remembers these things. A friend I asked a little bit ago, I said, you know, do we celebrate things that happened a thousand years ago? Do we celebrate things that happened 300 years ago? I mean, there are some, there are some parts of the world, I guess, they still celebrate uh, events, uh, the, the countries that have a little older history than the United States of America. But think about it. A thousand years ago? That's a long time. Has the significance changed any? You know, I look, I look at people today and how they observe uh, some of our national holidays. And it, it makes me wonder, you know, will they be celebrating it or will they be observing it, you know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now? Like Veterans Day, when I was growing up, we turned school out. We Not, not turned school out, we had programs and we honored the veterans. We had veterans that lived in our community and we came they came and we did a program for them and we uh, we honored them and we said a th thank you for them. My my granddad fought in World War One and uh, you know just a, a number of other men in the community and uh, you know we we had uh, people giving speeches and and uh, we love America sort of thing. Is that even done today? December 7th wasn't too long ago, just a few weeks ago. And, uh, you know, I guess people talked about it. 
what do they do in school? You know, some of these days just become days, uh, uh, different days. You know, just another day of the week. They don't have much significance. How much significance will some of our national holidays have? You know, uh, 50, 60, 80, 100 years from now. Are they losing their significance because we're not observing them? They haven't really impressed upon us the the uh, uh, the significance of what happened on those days. See, I mean, the Fourth of July. It's just a, you know, what what's the significance of the Fourth of July? Well, hey, that is when we cook hot dogs and hamburgers and shoot fireworks. See, that's not that's not the point of the day. But God's power. When he, when he acted upon a certain day or in certain events, changed the world. That's my point. That's my point. It changed the world. It demonstrated his power so that something happened that is still observed yearly. All right? It's still observed yearly. But friends, do you realize there's another day? There's another day that has left an even greater mark on the world. There's a greater day in history that took place, an event that took place that as much as the deliverance from Egyptian bondage had on the world, as great of an impact as it had on the world and still has today, even lingering after people observing the Passover, even though it's no longer necessary for the Jewish people, it just shows how powerful of a market left. But there's, there's another day. There's, a, there's another day in history that has an even greater significance than the leaving of Egypt by the children of Israel. There's another day. There's another day that's, that's coming up that has a greater significance and will continually have a greater significance until the end of the world. And I said that day's coming up and I, I'm, I want to impress upon your mind now, that event, that event is going to be celebrated this Sunday. Now, I know people, a lot of people are thinking, uh, you know, well, I know what that day is. Yeah, I know what that day is coming up Sunday, right? Everybody's getting ready for it. But here's the thing. It may not be what you think. The event that's going to be celebrated by faithful Christians this coming Sunday it's not. It's not celebrating baby Jesus. No, it's not Christmas. It's not Jesus was born in a manger. That's not the celebration. That's not the event that's going to be commemorated. And that's not the event that really changed the world, if you want to get right down to it. You say, well, James, you mean to tell me you don't think the birth of Christ changed the world? Oh, no doubt about it, the birth of Christ changed the world. I mean, if Christ hadn't been born, the world wouldn't have been changed. But the birth of Christ didn't do anything for the world other than bring the Messiah into the world. If Christ had not have lived his life, and if he had not have suffered what he suffered, and if he had not have died on the cross for the sin of the world, and if he had not been buried and raised again on the third day, he'd just been another man. And so the death, burial, and resurrection is the event that's going to take place this Sunday that faithful Christians are going to celebrate and observe. Matt, we're going to put the phone numbers up. Yeah. So here's what we're talking about. We're talking about a day that changed history. It's the death, burial, and resurrection. It's the resurrection of Christ from the grave. <clears throat> it's what changed history. Now, friends, I want you to think about this. See, someone says, well, the birth of Christ is more important. No. Christ did not change the world. What changed the world was Christ raising from the dead. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 12. This is what Paul says. He says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, 
how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. Why? Why, why are you... Paul says, look, if he didn't raise from the dead, we're lying about God. Why? Because we have testified that God hath raised up Christ, whom he raised up not, if so be that the dead rise not. See, you can, you can argue all you want to that Christ was born. Hey, that's great. That's great. Christ was born. So was I. Everybody watching TV. Everybody watching this program. You know what? You were born. You're just like Jesus. You were born. You were born into this world. But you know what? That's not what world changing. That's not all, uh, life uh, changing or life altering. That's not world shattering. Not compared to what happened when he raised from the dead. For if Christ rise not up, if Christ, if the dead, for if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. See what Paul's saying? Paul says, look, the most important aspect to Christianity is that Christ raised from the dead. If Christ didn't raise from the dead, then he's just like a man. He's just, he lived, he died, and he's in the grave. And there's no earth-changing event connected really to his life if he hadn't raised from the dead. He said, well, there's a lot of men that have lived and died and they, they changed the world. That's true. But Christ died and rose again. Now that is the power of God being demonstrated. And that, my friends is the significance of the day that we're celebrating. That's the significance of the, uh, of the occasion. That's the whole point. We're celebrating the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. If Christ hadn't raised from the dead, there really wouldn't be any Christianity. If Christ hadn't raised from the dead, Christianity would be just like Islam. It'd be following the dead man. See? If Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, then you know what? The Lord's church, or what he established in the, in the Bible, it wouldn't be any different than, than following Martin Luther. He's following a dead man. See, how many, how many people are following dead men? Everybody in the denominational world are following dead men. But not in the Lord's church. In the Lord's church, we're following a man that was raised from the dead. <clears throat> and we're remembering we're celebrating, we're observing this coming Sunday, we're observing his death, burial, and resurrection. We're commemorating it. So, I said, you know, is there something that we celebrate every first day of the week? Or is there something that we celebrate, I'm sorry, is there something we celebrate that's, that happened uh, thousands of years ago? Yeah, there is something. It's the resurrection of Christ. Christ was raised from the dead on the first day of the week, friends. See, it's not about December 25th. It's not about January 7th or September the 3rd or July the 7th or October the 52 or whatever. It's, it's not about a month and a day. It's about the day of the week. It's on the first day of the week that is the significance. Notice in Matthew 28. Matthew 28. <clears throat> in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. It was on the first day of the week. The Sabbath was ended. It was beginning to dawn on the first day of the week. This is when they come to the tomb. Some will say, well, you know, we can... We can celebrate on the on, on Saturday night. No, 
Friends, notice this. When the Sabbath was passed, this is Mark chapter 16. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him and very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came to the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. The first day of the week. Now, the Seventh-day Adventist, our Seventh-day Adventist neighbors, they'll tell us that the Catholics changed the day to Sunday. But the Bible clearly says that it's on the first day of the week that Christ was raised from the dead. See? On the first day of the week. Luke chapter 24 and verse 1. Luke 24 and verse 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning they came to the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. Again, it's on the first day of the week. What is the significance of, of the celebration that we're going to be observing Sunday. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And it's the celebration of the fact that our Lord and Savior is no longer in the grave. The grave couldn't hold him. Death could not hold him. And that's what we're remembering Sunday. On the first day of the week is when Christ was raised up from the dead. It was, it's, his, it's his birthday, if you will. Birthday from the dead. Not birthday in the in the crib, but birth from the crypt. See that? What, are, what am I talking about? Well, just look at this. Look at this. In uh, let's see, in Acts. Chapter 13 and verse 33. Acts 13 and verse 33. Let's get a little context here. Um uh, Here's uh, I believe it's Peter talking here. See, um, and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that, he raised him up from the dead. Now no more to return to corruption. He said to it this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Declared to be the son of God by the raising up from the dead. This day thou art my son. This day thou art my son. This day I have begotten thee. Christ being raised from the dead was was his birthday. He was born from the grave. He was raised up from the grave. So you want to talk about, well, we don't celebrate the birth of Christ. I'm going to celebrate the birth of Christ from the grave this coming Sunday. I'm not worried about a baby in a manger. I'm glad that he that he fulfilled all the prophecies. He was born of a virgin and all that. I'm, I'm glad of that. But on the first day of the week is when I'm going to celebrate and observe Christ being born from the dead. Now, think with me, friends. Do you consider the 4th of July just another day in history? Now, some people might. But do you consider events that we commemorate, days that we commemorate, when we observe certain things that have happened in the past, do you consider it just be another day in history? Or do you stop and say, you know what, this is something special happening this day? Listen, if an event changes the world, if an event changes the world, it deserves to be celebrated. It deserves to be commemorated. <clears throat> it deserves to be acknowledged. 
once a year. But think about this. If something happened to the point that it is supposed to be observed every week, every first day of the week, isn't that a greater event? Wouldn't that be a greater, uh, more significant event? Seeing as on the first day of the week is when the disciples kept the Lord's Supper and remembered the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be something a little more special? Notice this in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached to them ready to depart on the morrow and continued his speech until midnight. Here's the example. On the first day of the week. Which day of the week? Every first day of the week. Every week has the first day. And so on every first day of the week is when faithful Christians are coming together to celebrate an event that changed the world. That is the resurrection of our Lord and Savior from the dead. That's, that's, what, that's what we're talking about here. They observed the Lord's Supper every first day of of the week. And so, just as the plagues, just as the plagues changed the world, just as crossing the Red Sea changed the world, just as it proved God's power to deliver His people and destroy the wickedness, just as it, as it has demonstrated uh, God's love for His people, just as it, as it demonstrated God's power to overcome uh, mankind and, and the, the strengths of man, the death, burial, and resurrection shows God's power to deliver men from death. Think about this. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part in the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. God raised up Jesus Christ from the dead to show he has more power than the devil. He has more power than the devil. The grave, the grave could not hold our Lord and Savior. Could not hold him. Notice this, in Acts chapter 2 uh, and verse 29, Peter says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of David, of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and that his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, that's the grave, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, wherefore, whereof we are all, we all are witnesses. God raised him up from the dead. He, he could, the grave couldn't hold him. And it proved God's power and it showed that God had the ability to change the world yet again. It was through the raising up of Christ from the dead that God changed the world. Romans 1 verse 3 and 4. Romans 1 verses 3 and 4. Listen to what Paul says. Concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Again, friends, if Christ is still in the grave, then that is not earth changing. That's not world changing. He's just another man that's dead in the grave. But he was raised from the dead. Again, the power of God demonstrating his power to deliver and change the world yet again. Now, friends, this is the reason why, this is the reason why we stress assembling on the first day of the week because we know it's resurrection day. It's the day that Christ raised from the dead. It's the Lord's day. It's the Lord's day. 
And every first day of the week, faithful men and women, members of the body of Christ, are assembled together to commemorate the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Listen to what Paul says. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Excuse me. 1 Corinthians. 11 and verse 23. Paul says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given things, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this is the cup of the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Now, the Christian remembers the death of Christ, his body, his blood. As often as we do this, that's what we're showing and someone says, well, we, we do that once a month, once a quarter, once a, once a year. One, one Sunday after the, the first whatever. Friends, is that, is that often enough? As often as you do it? The Lord's Supper is what we use to commemorate, to remember a life-changing, a world-changing event, really. A world-changing event. And so we celebrate it. We observe it on the first day of the week. Now, I want you to consider how some people feel about that. I want you to consider the uh, the way some individuals feel about the Lord's Supper. Now, if I said this, if I said what I'm about to say <clears throat> about the 4th of July, or if I said what I'm about to say about Veterans Day or some other uh, holiday, individuals would be livid. They'd be upset. But I want you to consider how some people view how some people view the Lord's Supper. This is from our friends that you see out in front of the store dingling. All right, this is Salvation Army. This is what the Salvation Army says about the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper or communion. Here's what they write. It says, There is no ground in the New Testament for the belief that Christ at his last Passover instituted a religious ordinance to be permanently and universally observed. Let that sink in. There's no ground in the New Testament, the, the uh, Salvation Army says, that says there's no permanent or universal observance. Then they say, had a permanent and obligatory right been instituted by Jesus, surely all four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, would have given full particulars. But three of them, Matthew, Mark, and John, do not mention any command regarding the Lord's Supper. Now, friends, let's just stop right there. That is just Bible ignorance going to seed right there. Matthew, Mark, and John don't mention anything regarding the Lord's Supper? Really? If I could find one of these, if I could find one of these individuals talking about the Lord's Supper, that's all I need to prove that the Salvation Army is telling a lie. They're telling a lie on God. Look at this. Matthew, Mark, and John don't say anything about it. All right? Well, let's just see about this. In Matthew chapter 26... And let's look at verse 26. 
And as they were eating, <clears throat> Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to uh, them saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, is that not the Lord's Supper being instituted right there? Is that not the Lord's Supper? Now, we can, you know, we can go to Luke. <clears throat> we can go to Luke uh, and we can find where uh, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. Um, got my verses wrong here. Let me just look right here real quick. My point is Luke 22 and verse 15. He said to them, With desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, <clears throat> Take this and divide it among yourselves. <clears throat> For I say unto you, excuse me, <clears throat> I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper saying, This is the cup of the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Now Paul, we just read Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, 11 where he says, Christ told him the same thing. He said basically the same thing. This is my cup of the New Testament. This is my body. This is my blood. This do in remembrance of me. So there's Matthew and Luke both saying the same thing. The Salvation Army is lying to individuals about <clears throat> the observance of the Lord's Supper. They would rather you go out and throw money in the pot and celebrate uh, baby Jesus than they would for you to do what the Bible says and celebrate and observe the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. They say it's not, it's not universal. That's what they say. But notice this. They say, although, did I get this? I'm sorry. All, uh, even although in course of time this custom gradually assumed sacramental character, there is nothing whatsoever to this show that this was according to God's intention or by his direction or that we are bound to observe this custom. <clears throat> Isn't it strange, friends? They want to say that something you can find in the Bible does not have scriptural basis and God did not intend for us to keep it. It was not a custom to be observed. We're not bound to observe it and yet they're going to go out and promote Baby Jesus born in the manger on December 25th. Because after all, that's in the Bible. See, friends, they're missing the point of the day. The day is not about the birth of Christ. <clears throat> the day is about his resurrection from the dead. The day is about his death, burial, and resurrection from the dead. That's, that's the significance. Now, they go on to say, the true communion of the body and blood of Christ is spiritual. It is partake of Christ's nature or character and is necessary for the support of the spiritual life to all of God's people, just as food and drink are necessary for the support of the life of the body. Jesus explained that this folly to his disciples. Many of them thought it was hard saying, if you can understand it. Thus, spiritual feeding upon Christ is the true supper of the Lord of which all may partake. Now, friends, you think about that. The, the Salvation Army just said, you don't have to take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. It's not a custom that's binding. God never intended for it. And it's not universal and it's not, uh, it's not to be observed uh, 
how they say it, uh, permanently or universally. Really? Well, friends, the Bible clearly shows differently. On the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread, Acts 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week is when they assembled to partake of the Lord's Supper, as off as ye do this. Now, what I'm here trying to stress to you, friends, is the day coming up, the first day of the week, when you look at the calendar, a lot of people are going to say, oh, it's December 25th. Yeah, it's a great day. You know what? If it was December 24th, 23rd, 21st, 22nd, 19th, 18th, whatever, if it's on a Sunday, if it's on the first day of the week, it is a special day. It's a special day. Sunday is the Lord's day. It is the day in which he was raised from the dead. But Sunday has turned into everything but what it's supposed to be. It's turned into everything but the day that the Lord intended for it. It's turned into Mother's Day. That's on a Sunday. Father's Day is on a Sunday, right? Go to the late day. That's on a Sunday. Sleep in day. That's on a Sunday. Mow the lawn Sunday. Super Bowl Sunday. Go hunting deer, go fishing, go playing golf Sunday. That's all Sunday. Race day is always on Sunday, right? Football, soccer ball, baseball, hot dogs, whatever is on Sunday. Sunday, motor yard Sunday. You know, everything Sunday. Except, except Jesus raised from the dead. This coming Sunday is going to be fat man in a red suit day. But no one wants to say what it really is supposed to be. The real significance of it is Jesus was born from the grave. Jesus was raised from the grave. Jesus was resurrected and showed the power of God over death. Now, can you tell me how important today is? I can. Just look how hard the devil works to make people think that it's something else. The devil works so hard to getting people to think that Sunday is just another day, it must be important. Friends, let me tell you. The early Christians hid in catacombs. They hid in the tombs in order to assemble on the first day of the week. They assembled under, under the threat of death. It must have been a special day and it must have been they were observing something special on that day. Not December 25th, but every first day of the week, they were assembling to worship God, to partake of the Lord's Supper, to lay by in store, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, to assemble, to, be, to sing songs of praise to God, to sing and make melody in their heart, Ephesians 5, verse 9, to edify and build up one another by assembling together. That's on the first day of the week. That's why it's so special. That's why it's so special. You see, friends, this coming Sunday, like every Sunday, is a special day for Christians. True Christians. Members of the Lord's church are going to be celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Let me ask you, how much effort do you make to commune with the Lord? Would you make to commune with the Lord if, if say he was going to come and have a five course meal with you? You know, I, all this political season, I've heard people paying thousands and thousands of dollars to go sit down with Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. Really? Pay all that money to go and sit and at, a, to, at, a, at a big fancy banquet <clears throat> for someone who really doesn't care about you and you're going to say, oh, but I was with them. I was there. I was there. But you could assemble with the Lord's people and commune with the Lord on the first day of the week if you remember the body of Christ. You could assemble and worship and commune with the Lord every first day of the week. You could, you could, you could commune with the, with, the, with the one who made the words and all that in them is on the first day of the week. If you wanted to, if you would. So this first day of the week, don't think about it being Christmas Day. Think about it being the Lord's Day. We're going to be celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Friends, I hope that this has been beneficial to you. And if I can help you in any way, I would be glad to do that. 276-340-2653 is how you can reach me. Word from the Lord at gmail.com.
Till next time, friends. Be safe. Always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.